as new restrictions are being enacted throughout the country, a generation that does not remember the history is becoming aware of the current threat to reproductive rights. I vividly remember the moment that I became an abortion activist, and that was the evening of July 3rd, 1989, when I was watching the news and heard of the Webster decision. States could now restrict um, abortion rights on a case-by-case -case basis. And what happened directly after that was some 500 anti-choice measures and bills were introduced. So it had a tremendous impact. It was a gateway to, to anti-choice legislation. Bills inspired or drafted by anti-abortion politicians are now pending or have passed in almost every state. In Kentucky, as in 30 other states, abortion funding is only available in cases of rape, incest, or life endangerment. This young woman faced serious obstacles when she applied for subsidized medical care after learning she had an abnormal pregnancy. We went for the ultrasound. And then she lifted down the cover. She said, you need to go over to uh, Dr. White's office. And I said, why is there something wrong? She said, you just need to go over there. Well, she was, Dr. White was telling me how some babies are born without a kidney, some babies were born without a heart or, or an arm or, you know, an organ. And then she, she said, well, your baby was without a brain tissue. So that was, a, that was the hardest thing I've ever heard in my life. Uh, it was obvious that the baby was anencephalic, which an anencephalic baby is a baby that when the neural tube or the spinal cord brain segment begins to develop, uh, there is no development at the top of the spinal cord. So you have up to the brain stem, which is the base of the brain back here that controls breathing, uh, the heart rate, but nothing above it. So above, from the ears and the eyebrows up, there is nothing. There is no brain. Well, Angela just cried and cried and cried because we wanted this baby so much. Well, you can't go down. And I asked the doctor, well, we can, I says, what do we do now? You know, and she said well, she can brain. carry the baby for nine months and take a risk on Angela's life and knowing that the baby had no chance or we could go and take the baby now um, and just do it this way and because of Angela's life. If I continued the pregnancy, um, the child would not, the child would not, you know, survive, not even a minute. So she said that, um, that the dangers were that the placenta, I would like, I could, there would be a chance where I could hemorrhage to death if I just went ahead and did that. And so I say no, I, I didn't see what, you know, why would I want to go through a whole nine months giving birth to a baby that wasn't going to be alive. To spare Angela the medical risk of carrying to term and the trauma of giving birth to a baby with no chance of survival, the family decided to end the pregnancy. They soon discovered that the several thousand dollar cost of the operation would not be covered by Medicaid. It was not an option for them to pay for this out of pocket. They would have had to stay within the medical card system, would have gone through the pregnancy, would have gone through the delivery, and then would have gone through the loss. And so Dr. White was telling me about this organization where they were trying to pass a law that people on Medicaid could, um, didn't have, you know, shouldn't have to do it because, you know, they know we didn't have the money and the baby wouldn't survive and my life was in danger. The ACLU took up this case to bring attention to the injustice of a law that does not take dangerous, high-risk pregnancies into account. I think there's a very um, passionate group in this state who are against abortion for any reason at all, ever, period, never. Um, there's nothing in this world that's that black and white. and. You're dealing with people who are not involved with a medical situation trying to make blanket decisions. If you've ever looked into a woman's eyes when you've just told her that her baby is doomed, it's, if they could see that, they would know.
why this has to be kept safe and legal and why we don't need more barriers for these women. Before we went through with this, I was against abortion. But when the situation comes up as much as this, there's got to be somebody to help these people and mothers that's gone through this. And I don't care what anybody says, you know, they, how could you do this? And they're not in my shoes. They went in Angela's shoes. If a poor woman has an unplanned pregnancy, her options are limited. Medicaid restrictions on abortion funding combined with cuts in family planning and reduced welfare allocations, place a heavy burden on low-income families. This nurse and midwife works in a county hospital. Many of her patients are women on assistance. Poor women are used to struggling, you know, struggling to have enough food, struggling to take care of the other children. They don't think immediately I don't have enough resources, because they don't have enough resources for their life. So that first they think about, what do I want to do? And the first thing is, I want to have a baby. And then, harsher reality sets in, and they begin to think, I've got three other kids, it's so hard, I'm struggling to make ends meet, I'm struggling, and, you know, 15th, and the check comes, and and there's not enough money for the last five days for food or transportation. And they begin to think, oh, no, this is too much. When women in that situation say, no more, when they say, one more child is too much, when that woman says, I can't, this is not said lightly. This is real. It means that they truly are at the end of their resources. The next barrier that comes up is getting to a place, if they want an abortion, to have it. And like, if they go to a clinic, it can be $300. That's a lot of money. That may be close to what her check is, you know? And so she doesn't have that. So. Then she begins to think. She goes to the county hospital. That's where I work. She calls the county to make an appointment because you can't just walk in. It can take two to three weeks to get an appointment. Then, in terms of scheduling it, it can be three to four weeks before we can schedule her in because of the press of other surgery. So that we're talking about women who are being pushed into second trimester abortion. While some laws impact low-income families, others are specifically aimed at young women. In a series of decisions starting in 1976, the Supreme Court ruled that states could require a minor to inform her parents before getting an abortion. Parental involvement laws are on the books and strictly enforced in 27 states. In 11 others, they are in place and could be activated at any time. One of the major problems that I see in educating teenagers about their rights in terms of abstinence or contraceptives or their right to abortion or to give up for adoption is the fact that there is legislation that specifically prohibits a teenager from making those choices on their own in many states. Especially when it comes to abortion, we present them with this maze of laws. You must go before a judge here in Minnesota if you don't wish to tell both of your biological parents. That's assuming a functioning nuclear family, and we know that's not a reality. These kids are being frightened away from asking for help. States that have parental involvement laws are required to provide the option of a waiver such as a judicial bypass. Meanwhile, anti-abortion forces are working to make these laws stricter, placing an additional burden on teens with difficult home situations. There certainly are some young women who, for a variety of reasons, and unfortunately physical abuse is one of them, that absolutely cannot tell their parents. And we talk to them then about judicial bypass. There are some counties in this state that have judges that are just absolutely opposed to abortion, no matter what the circumstances. And when a young woman comes to them seeking the judicial bypass, they're put off 
and it drives some young women to either go to an incompetent abortion provider, an illegal provider, and they're still out there, or to try to do a home remedy. And, and there's still plenty of that going on in Alabama. The one that really comes to my mind first when I think back about this was a 15-year-old girl, and someone told her that if she would douche with bleach, that she would abort on her own. So that's what she'd been doing for about a week when she came to us. The vaginal tissue had caustic burns that were just phenomenal. Um, her vagina was just blistered to the point that it had swollen shut all the way. She couldn't be examined. The, the desperation level is already here. It's the young women, it's the poor women. It's the women who feel like they can't tell anybody, who feel so socially ostracized because of the dilemma that they find themselves in in the first place. As the states pass more and more restrictive laws that make it harder and harder, that shrink access more and more, we see those numbers growing.